To many people who are fans of the Supremes, or even just know a few things about them, Florence Ballard is the true unsung leader of the group. Most people who know anything about Florence Ballard and her time with the Supremes see her as the strongest vocalist among the three women who was pushed out when Barry Gordy started to develop romantic feelings for Diana Ross. The widely told story is basically that Barry Gordy thought that Florence Ballard's voice was too black to garner major crossover hits for Motown. Diana's voice was white enough to succeed on the pop charts, so Barry Gordy pushed Florence to the side to be what was tantamount to a backup singer to Diana Ross. And to add insult to injury, he started showing Diana favoritism over Florence because he was having an affair with Diana. Then, after being pushed to the side, she was completely pushed out and no longer being a supreme led her into a deep depression and alcoholism. All of this may have happened exactly as we heard it, but could there have been another source of pain that led to Florence Ballard's depression, downward spiral, and untimely death? What about the future NBA player who reportedly had his way with her at knife point? Did she ever get over that? Was that horrible incident as much of a contributing factor to her drinking and depression as the way she had been treated by Barry Gordy and Diana Ross? Let's explore it. If you like these videos about your favorite and most scandalous celebrities from yesteryear that make the Ty Said What Ty Said channel a time capsule for the culture, subscribe and hit the notification bell so that you can know every time I upload one of these videos or every time that I live stream and the comment, I subscribed, in the comment section so that I can say hello to you. And I have to share this with you. Hello, this is Bernadette Stannis, Thelma from Good Times, and I'd love for you to join me on May 14 at 8 p.m. Eastern Time for Ty Said What Ty Said YouTube channel. We're celebrating her 30,000 subscribers. We're going to have fun and a good time. Now, on to why you are here. Florence Ballard was once considered the lost supreme, but thankfully she is not anymore. She was the inspiration for the plump, soulful Effie in the Broadway musical and subsequent movie Dreamgirls. There are now entire websites devoted to her, and there should be when you consider that according to widespread testimony, she was the girl group's strongest singer. Small wonder Florence Ballard has attracted so much attention, however belated. Hers is a rags to riches to rags story, a classic showbiz saga with a sad ending. The eighth of 13 siblings, Florence Ballard grew up in poor, mostly segregated neighborhoods in Detroit and began singing at an early age at the Brewster Projects, she met two young women who would be catapulted into fame alongside her, Mary Wilson and Diane, not yet Diana, Ross. While still in high school, Florence formed the Primettes, grabbing Mary Wilson first, then Diane Ross to join them. They sang background vocals for Marvin Gaye and other Motown stars, but they struggled to score a hit on their own even after Barry Gordy signed them to a contract as the Supremes. Everything changed once they were paired with the legendary songwriting producing team, Holland Dozer Holland. Where did our love go? Shot up to number one and stayed there for 11 weeks. After that, the hits just kept on coming. Among them, Baby Love, Come See About Me, and You Keep Me Hanging On. By the way, what is your favorite song by the Supremes? Answer in the comments, I'd like to know. From the beginning, Florence Ballard and Diana Ross vied to be the group's lead singer. Otis Williams of The Temptations has written that Florence's voice, quote, had a real depth of feeling and a strong churchy sound. When she opened her mouth to sing, you sat up in your chair, end quote. Diana, on the other hand, had a small, 
high-pitched voice, and a girlish demeanor. But Barry Gordy firmly believed that Diana would have a greater appeal to white audiences than Florence Ballard. And, as Barry Gordy increasingly pushed Diana into the lead spot, tensions mounted between the two women, and the once high-spirited Florence became increasingly sullen and testy. Florence thought of Barry Gordy as a father figure, and things seemed to have started out that way. Barry's relationship with the Supremes was that of a mentor, but it didn't take long at all for Barry Gordy to become romantically attracted to Diana Ross, and his attraction was very obvious to those inside and outside of the group. Florence felt betrayed, not by the romantic relationship that Barry had with Diana, but by the fact that she was being reduced to a backup singer of a group that she helped create. Barry was pushing his lover to the forefront, but let's be honest, that was a good business move for the label. And Florence's friend, Diana, was so focused on her own ambition that she didn't stop to consider Florence's feelings. It didn't take long for the stress of the business to take its toll on Florence. The stress manifested itself through weight gain. Then she started drinking, heavily. The alcohol compounded the weight problem, which was easily visible to the audiences. Not only was her behavior unreliable, her stage costumes no longer fit her once smaller frame. In public, Florence was doing her best to keep up appearances where possible. She maintained that all was well between her and the other girls and claimed that stories about hair pulling fights with Diana Ross were wrong. But apparently, keeping up appearances was not Florence Ballard's forte. She couldn't hide how she really felt about being progressively sidelined by Barry Gordy's obsession with Diana Ross. So her drinking continued and she was identified by Motown as a problem. Well, no one wants to be seen as the problem in their workplace, and Florence knew that she would never have a chance like this again, so she attempted to get back into Gordy's good graces by sobering up and slimming down. But it all came to a head one night during an onstage incident at the Flamingo Hotel in Las Vegas on June 29, 1967. This ended it all, and the incident was precipitated by Florence's discovery of an extra set of stage costumes supposedly set aside for her replacement. After seeing the costumes, she went on stage inebriated and began to dance in a provocative manner. Gordy immediately fired Florence Ballard and replaced her with Cindy Birdsong from Patti LaBelle and the Bluebells, whom he'd been quietly grooming behind Florence's back for quite a while. Not surprisingly, the group subsequently would be known as Diana Ross and the Supremes. The rest of Florence Ballard's life was consumed by legal battles with various lawyers she hired to represent her and Motown, notorious for shortchanging its talent. When her attempts to launch a solo career fizzled, she spiraled downward, plagued by drinking and depression. And while it is beyond easy to see how being pushed out of a girl group that she helped to create by people who she thought were friends and had her best interests in mind, then to see that group become one of the biggest success stories in music history, well, that would be more than enough to drive anyone to depression. But I want to stop and take a look at what Peter Benjaminson suggests may have been the first and true source of Florence Ballard's depression. Who is Peter Benjaminson and why do I care about what his thoughts are regarding Florence Ballard's depression? Peter Benjaminson has written a number of books about Motown and its artists. That alone gives him some credibility, but in 1975, he was a writer for the Detroit Free Press. He was assigned to write a piece on Florence Ballard, who had been fired by Motown's founder, Barry Gordy, and reduced to collecting welfare. And he recorded eight hours of conversation with Florence Ballard, which is more than I have seen of anyone else. So he has a lot of information on her directly from her. So back to her depression. 
Benjamin suggests that the depression may have been fueled by an early incident. As a teen, Florence Ballard had been violated by a young thug from the neighborhood, Reginald Harding. He later became a center for the Detroit Pistons, and he had quite a history of criminal activity. Mary Wilson has said that the assault, which I'm replacing for the R word, ate away at Flo's insides. She was scared for the rest of her life. I have read this quote over and over and wondered if it was a misprint and if the word scarred was intended to be there instead of scared. Let's leave that quote as is, but we can see that Florence Ballard's older sister definitely believes that this assault in which Florence's virginity was taken did scar her sister for life. Maxine Ballard told the Daily UK he assaulted her. Again, I'm using the word assault instead of the R word. He hurt her physically and he hurt her emotionally. He took her virginity and she told me that she felt that something had been stolen from her that she could never replace. Well, who is this he? Reginald Harding. He was the top player at Detroit Eastern High School. He was one of the best players in the country and averaged 31.3 points, 25 rebounds, 10 blocks, and eight assists per game as a senior. Harding was popular on Detroit's Lower East Side. He was a seven-foot marvel in the days of Wilt Chamberlain, star of the Basketball City Champions, good-looking, and people wanted to be around him. But he would often use his size to his advantage off the court. Harding was said to have been a bully to those smaller than him and had several run-ins with the law while in high school. His foster parents were concerned about all the trouble that he was getting into, and in the summer of 1959, they sent him up north to Cadillac, Michigan, to a cherry picking farm. He was the only black kid on the farm and was often teased for his height and color. It was far from his celebrity status on the gritty streets of Detroit that he was used to, and he wanted to leave ASAP and go home. So he stole the farmer's truck and headed home to Detroit. The biggest indictment on Harding's life is that he was an accused serial sex criminal, and by that I do mean the word that starts with R. In 1960, while competing in a cross-country meet on Bell Isle with Eastern High, he was arrested for having sexual intercourse with a 15-year-old girl. He was 18. Harding was charged with statutory assault that starts with R, but said that the sex was consensual. He was acquitted of the charges. That same year, Harding offered a ride to a student from Northeastern High named Florence Ballard. Florence Ballard and Reginald Harding both attended a sock hop at Detroit's famous Greystone Ballroom, which used to be located on Woodward and Willis. She attended the party with her brother, but got separated from him. With home not being too far away in the Brewster Douglas projects, Florence decided to walk home, but there was Harding willing to take her home, and she accepted. To her, he was no stranger really. It was Reggie Harding, everyone knew him, but instead of taking her south down Woodward, he took her to an empty lot on Woodward and Canfield where reportedly he violated her at knife point. Florence went into a deep depression for weeks before telling Diane Ross and the other girls what happened to her. And just like any other trouble Harding had gotten himself into, he continued on with his life as if nothing happened leading Eastern to another city basketball title. In 1961, Reginald Harding graduated from Eastern High. He was one of the top players in the country, but college was not an option for him. The story is that he could not read and was passed through school because he was a great basketball player. So he attended Nashville Christian Institute, a prep school in Tennessee in 1962. He also played semi-pro basketball for the Toledo Tartans and Holland Oilers in the Midwest Professional Basketball League. 
He became the first player drafted by the NBA that did not play a single college game when his hometown Detroit Pistons chose him in the sixth round of the 1962 NBA draft. They also selected him again in the fourth round of the 1963 draft, his first official year in the league. Always considered a pro since his high school days, but constantly putting those projections in jeopardy due to the trouble he was getting into, Harding was finally making his NBA dreams come true. He played with the Pistons from 1963 to 1967 and had his best year during the 64-65 season, averaging 12 points and 11.6 rebounds per game. But apparently he was an even better criminal than he was a basketball player. He was known to carry a pistol in his gym bag, and the gun cases and assault charges began to pile up in Detroit. In those days, NBA teams did not have a dozen assistant coaches and other specialists monitoring and catering to players. In the 1960s, trouble, women, drugs, liquor, and guns were not hard to find, and those things are just what Harding liked. He was known to either go to the club straight from the game or practice, or come to the game or practice straight from the club, and no one was around to hold him responsible. That is how he always had it since he roamed the streets of Detroit. Those around him allowed him to do just about whatever he wanted, and he certainly had no plans of ever holding himself responsible for his deplorable actions. So his rise to popularity was ironically his downfall. He returned to the Pistons for the 66-67 season, but his numbers declined dramatically and the organization was fed up with him. So they traded him to the Chicago Bulls before the 67-68 season. He only lasted for 14 games there and was ousted by the team for his insubordinate actions. He landed with the Indiana Pacers of the ABA, but Harding's actions became even more offensive there. Harding turned to violence, like the time he pulled a pistol on teammate Jimmy Rail because he felt he was a racist. He was out of control now, and his days of playing professional basketball were numbered. The final straw came when he threatened to kill Pacers general manager Mike Storen during a television interview. He did put up a double-double for the Pacers, but his antics were too much, and Harding was done in Indiana and with professional basketball altogether. From there, life did not get any easier for Reginald Harding. He did a two-year stint in Jackson State Prison in Jackson, Michigan for parole violation. Then it was back to the east side streets of Detroit where it all began for him hanging out with the neighborhood nobodies and drug dealers. He was even hooked on heroin. Some say that he was working on a comeback to the NBA and trying to get clean. On September 1st, 1972, Harding was doing what he usually did in the hood, hanging out on the corner with friends, drinking and partying their lives away, when he got into an argument with a guy named Carl Scott. The two knew each other from the neighborhood. Scott was a bad guy too, having served time in Jackson State Prison as well. The two got into a physical altercation when Scott slapped the much taller Harding, who was in shock. So he retaliated, slapping him back. And then he did something that he was known for. He picked him up and held him high in the air, embarrassing him. Apparently this was one of his bully moves. He did it in front of everyone on the corner. Scott ran off, furious at what Harding had done to him, and wanted revenge. While Harding was standing on the corner of Kerchival and Parkview in the city's east side talking to some girls, Scott returned to avenge his embarrassment, pistol in hand, pointing it high in the air at Harding. Quote, if you shoot me, shoot me in the head. I don't want to feel no pain, end quote. Scott did just that, shooting Harding once to get him to the ground and then putting the final bullet in his head before taking off once again. 
Harding died a day later in Detroit General Hospital, victim to the streets he called home, to people that watched him grow from a teenage basketball prodigy to a 30-year-old street junkie. Once again, Harding's so-called friends failed him. Once again, he failed himself, but for the last time. His funeral was held a week later at Greater Mount Carmel Baptist Church on Mack Avenue, right up the street from his now-closed Eastern High School. Had he actually been grateful for all of the chances that he got, all of the crimes he got away with, he might have actually put more effort into his game and taken the opportunity to turn his life around. He possibly could have been as good as Wilt Chamberlain and Bill Russell, two guys he played against in the NBA, had he spent more time on the court facing opponents instead of in court facing charges. He didn't live his life straight and he wasn't buried straight. He was taller than the average human and his grave site was too short for his coffin to fit into. So they had to bury him at an angle, kind of upside down. Sounds about right to me. As for Florence Ballard, she would be dead four years after her assaulter. The official cause of her death was coronary artery thrombosis at the absurdly young age of 32. And for the final nail in her coffin, it seems as though Diana Ross saw fit to upstage her one last time at her funeral, which attracted some 5,000 fans, according to Peter Benjaminson, who was there himself. But when Diana Ross jumped out of her limousine at the New Bethel Baptist Church, the fans actually booed her. Inside, seated with Florence's family, Diana grabbed Florence's youngest daughter, Lisa, and placed the child on her lap. Photographers snapped away, and the image of Diana Ross and little Lisa was published around the world. The only image, as it turned out, that most people ever saw from Florence Ballard's funeral. My sources for this video are aarp.org, Daily Mail UK, Chicago Tribune, Sydney Morning Herald, Gold Mine, and Michigan Preps. Thank you so much for tuning in to the Ty Said What Ty Said channel. Please leave a thumbs up and comment so that we can get a discussion going. And share this video on all of your social media, especially your Facebook. That really helps me out a lot. And subscribe and hit the notification bell so that you can know when my next video is ready for you. And if you don't like what I'm saying, but you love it, feel free to hit that applaud button just below your video screen there and send me some donations, donations, donations. Yeah, baby. See you on the next video.